Hello. Ah, hello. <laughs> I okay. did this stereotypical uh, leaving the microphone switched off. Classic. It's a cl- to be fair, <laughs> I nearly forgot to plug mine in. So oh, well. folks off to a good start. <laughs> right. Let me just get this all sorted here. Is okay. the uh, is the sound okay for you? Sound is perfection. I've got a very good quality microphone okay, on your end. <laughs> <laughs> um, first of all, loving the background. Very ex- uh, good choice. Thank you, thank you. I uh, uh, yeah, I made this. Um, I don't know what it was now. About a, two years ago, nearly. I think now I started trying to make a CGI version of the original console ro- room. Oh, I um, remember. Yeah, I remember you. And uh, I'm currently redoing it now in Blender to make it a little bit more photorealistic. It's going to be for a video at some point, but uh, oh, nice. yeah, I thought I'd set it as my background just to make because uh, behind me is actually quite boring. It's just a wall <laughs> and a bookcase. So I'll just move that fan actually because now I feel I feel I need to get one. Through. Let me just scour my computer <laughs> for an image. I'm sure I have something on here. <laughs> Hold on a second. <laughs> there we go. Perfect. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> no, I can have that there. It's just, just, a, just got a big eye, eye, two eyes either side of your head now. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm being watched. <laughs> <laughs> now I can just never address that and just have it be there. Right. <laughs> Let me have my other little camera going. Just so I have... It's a bit easier to edit. So, yeah. There we go. Right. Um, do you know, I, I do this every time. I never have an intro for these. So I, I go to be like, all right, let's start the interview. But then I'm like, oh, wait, <laughs> I have nothing to start with. So um, I'll just say, <laughs> hello. Hello. Hi. Hello. Thank you for having <laughs> me on. It's a great honor. No, I, I, it's a pleasure <laughs> to have you here, my man. It's... Um, I mean, much like everyone I bring on, I'm I'm a big fan. I've I've loved your content <laughs> since the the first Hartnell review came out. It's it's absolutely terrific oh, what you, you do. Thank you very much. No, uh, <laughs> worth every. Thank you, thank you. So uh, we'll we'll jump into it. We'll jump in. Um, first of all, I mean, the main and obvious thing I have to praise about you is the the, the sheer research and, and the flow as well of all of the sort of main Doctor Who <laughs> reviews. It just um, they all yeah. seem to go very well and go through the history. It's always very interesting, I, even to the fact of you planning your Q and A, um, based in separating it into sections. Like everyone else, when they do Q and A, <laughs> they just kind of do it rapid fire. But it's like no, no, it needs to be it needs to be sorted here. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I'm a bit slow and uh, ponderous in that way sometimes. I think it's the teacher in me. Uh, ah. I have to structure things. Well, that really came out of the fact that once I re- once I um, looked at all the questions and started recording for the Q and A, um, I realised that that was going to be a really long video. So I thought I really need to split this up into parts. So, yeah, I thought I'd theme them onto things so people that had no interest in my personal life would be able to skip over that and get to the important stuff. So <laughs> oh, well, they're, they're missing out. You, I, I watched all three. I took some, oh, well, took thank some you. time to put them because, um, you know, I'm I'm what you'd call a casual fan. Uh, I've watched all the reviews, hmm. but that's uh, where I stopped. So I watched the Q&As. There are a lot of interesting stuff, but obviously I, I, I had to cut a lot of my questions because I'm like, oh, wait, he's already answered most of them. So <laughs> well. whoops. <laughs> I can always put new spins on things. <laughs> That's true. That's true. What is your name? No. Um, so <laughs> with all of well, it's the, not Dick. I'll it's tell you that Dick. much. A lot of people like to call me. I picked clip originally when I was back in November of 2016 when I decided I was going to give YouTube a go. I thought I need a name for my channel and it's going to be need to be something kind of catchy and i didn't necessarily want to make it specific to doctor who um because i do at some point want to do some other things and didn't want to completely brand my channel in that way and i thought i don't you know say I need something kind of you. maybe a bit self-deprecating uh, yes that's true i mean it is uh, <laughs> it is my obsession but still um i don't want to close off different avenues in the future but uh, yeah i thought clever rick and it was clever Rick for about 10 minutes. And I thought that's awful because the one thing I hate more than being called Dick is being called Rick. Um, 
So, yeah, I thought, well, it's got to be Clever Dick, hasn't it? Because of Clever Dick. But I've actually been quite surprised. A lot of people, maybe it's an international thing, but even some of the uh, students that I teach who have stumbled across my channel have thought that it might be something slightly deviant at first because people don't seem to realise that Dick is actually short for Richard. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> it is one of those things because, funnily enough, there was something I was going to ask, whether uh, your name was either a, re a really odd uh, penis joke or just extremely vain because <laughs> like it's either you're I, I th either that, yeah or it's like oh i'm i'm clever richard how are you <laughs> i'm Jeep. yes I, I i it's a mixture of vanity yes i think well i <laughs> thought i mean the term clever dick i mean historically is uh, described as someone who is annoyingly kind of pedantic and and likes to point things out uh, excuse me and i thought well in a kind of self-deprecating way, that's kind of what my videos are about. It's about going into the minutiae. So I thought, I, I think I suppose it was a way of kind of heading off um, uh, any uh, criticism, perhaps, uh, before it got to me by saying, yes, I know I'm annoying, um, <laughs> <laughs> getting out of the way, I think. Well, whatever, would you say that works? Do you, or do you still see comments like, <laughs> oh, this guy's disappearing up his own backside? Uh, rarely, but you know, I mean, it's YouTube, isn't it? So you're gonna you're yeah. gonna get some people that get very very cross from time to time, but uh, no, generally people are, are very very nice and complimentary, and I I have to uh, I have to take everything in the same way that I would with any criticism. I have to take it with a pinch of salt, you know, because uh, people I I'm I'm free, every time I do a, a video, I I am it's a it's a wonderful. Um, support mechanism i suppose for you know the 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 appreciation that people show and the and the gratitude that people show which really makes it kind of really all worth it you know i know that sounds a bit cliche but uh, you know it's it's true you know because that's what i kind of set out to do to do something that was entertaining and informative and 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 maybe a little bit different from what else was available i mean i've always been quite conscious of the fact that um being a fan for you know going on 30 years now uh and and having the um the privilege of being able to amass all the dvds and the magazines and the books and having the time and money to be able to do that puts me in quite a privileged position and um uh, whilst the kind of things that that i like you can get on the dvd some fantastic work i'm conscious of the fact that a lot of people either because of where they live or how much money they have, haven't really got access to that kind of information other than written on Wikipedia. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm quite pleased that um, for a lot of people like that, it, it acts as a way to uh, very easily, you know, delve into what's so great about the show and why I love it so much, you know? No, oh, totally. I absolutely get it. Also, before we get back to the questions, uh, I know you mentioned it in one of your Q&As, <laughs> but it's fun to see it uh, in person, as it were, your uh, obsession with you know is it's truly present and here's the thing i only say sorry that, yes i only say that because i've got the same thing with the word um i've been bullying myself about it to the point where i'm trying to stop it mm. especially because i've got the live show coming up but it's you've, it's always that little it's thing that become... comes up yeah and you become even more conscious of it don't you when you when you're making videos and they're going online you you but we're our own worst critics. We really notice these things and pick holes in it ourselves. Um, yeah, I think that all goes back to the fact that despite the fact that um, I'm a very verbose and wordy person, um, when I was younger, I think um, I struggled in some way to express myself. Mm. Uh, and I think that was partly what drove me to reading lots and enlarging my vocabulary so much. Um, so I got into that habit, I think, when I was younger of just always going, do you know what I mean? Do you understand me? You know, you know, yeah. Um, uh, just seeking that clarification that I was making sense and wasn't just waffling <laughs> nonsense. Um, so, yeah, it's a habit that, yeah, I'd like to break. <laughs> oh, yeah, the amount of I'm sure editing you, you and me have the, both the same thing. It's just like, oh, I said it again. It's just so you cut that little bit out <laughs> and it just keeps coming. It's, yeah, I, I can relate to that mm. completely. Um, mm. So going back to the reviews, um, there's there's my ums. There we go. Uh, <laughs> where does, let's say the first Hartnell one or, or the first companion ones you did, where does the process start? Is it just 
the um, research side of things? Is it going back to the DVDs or the books? Where does it all start? Well, the whole thing started um, partly out of having the opportunity uh, and the inclination to to go and do something on YouTube. And that kind of coincided with the fact that I had um, managed to, it got to the point in the DVD releases where pretty much all of them had been released and I, I'd been getting them and higgledy piggledy order that they were originally released in. Um, so I could, I had the, uh, uh, opportunity then to actually sit down and watch all of Doctor Who from the beginning, um, you know, listening to the missing stories and watching telly stats for those ones that were missing and buying the odd one that I hadn't yet got a hold of to fill in the gaps as I went. Mm. And so I'd started watching all of those and um, I found it really interesting because although I'd seen them all before, it gave me some interesting new perspectives, um, uh, you know, considering how um, things that I'd seen kind of taken out of context and seen in isolation, how they played a bit differently. And I appreciated them slightly differently when put into the context of, of the, the whole show. Mm. Um, so I was reading things and looking stuff up as I always do just to help enrich that enjoyment really. And I thought, um, you know, this is where there's an opportunity for me to make something to, 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 to kind of condense all this, in, in perhaps a more accessible way for people. Um, so uh, the original video, the very first one I did, which I actually had to take down and re-upload at a later date because I used a, I used the orbital uh, cover of the Doctor Who theme for the opening uh, theme. Yeah. And um, uh, the, the music company about a year or so afterwards said, no, you're not allowed to do this. And I said, but it's not monetized. And they went, no, you're not, you can't use it. And I said, I'm talking over it. Nope. So I had to re-upload it. So that's the last time I try and be cool and use something that isn't uh, uh, BBC uh, copyright, because at least I know where I stand with them. Um, but anyway, I did this, did the first video, which was just a kind of a statement of it intent. And it kind of grew out of that. I thought I didn't know how it would go down, whether, um, you know, I'd be allowed to, to put it online because it had so much footage from the show in, albeit transformed, you know, and for the purposes of review and all that, I didn't know. Um, and, uh, you know, without going to the nitty gritty of all that, it kind of went through. And then I thought, right now I'll, I'll do, I, you know, I plan to do a video on each era. Uh, and, uh, the thing was, um, I didn't quite know what I was going to say in it. It kind of, I thought, well, you know, is this a review? Is this a, a guide? Is it a retrospective? Is it an introduction for new viewers or, or viewers of New Who who hadn't seen the classic era or found it intimidating? Um, is it, I, I, I just, is it a creative thing? I didn't quite know. And I just kind of sat down. I, funnily enough, I was working as a supply teacher at the time. Um, and I don't work for the supply company anymore. So I think it's okay for me to say that one day I just went, I was out of school and in between lessons when I probably should have been doing something to earn my money. Mm -hmm. I just sat at one of the computers and wrote half of the William Hartnell episode. And I just <laughs> thought, what are the key information that people are going to need? So for that, um, I drew a lot just out of my brain. And then I, then as I refined it, I, I looked online and, and correlated a few things. Um, and and then put that together but that first episode was very much a kind of a an a very much a, an overview um it's not as comprehensive as perhaps i would do it now or the other videos that i do now um because i wasn't quite sure i think of what people would stick around for and i didn't necessarily want to go into real nitty gritty um, would you say that's changed and I all these episodes later yeah, definitely. I think once I did the, I think it was really once I did, well, first of all, the, the Tom Baker video, which was obviously a bit longer because it's a longer era. Um, uh, but also that then being Tom Baker is almost like a lightning rod for, for fandom, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people started watching that video. So like pretty much overnight, I, I was getting thousands of views, whereas I'd been sort of cruising along quite nicely for a year or so. And having very nice supportive comments and, you know, I'd gained a, a few hundred subscribers. Um, but then I uploaded that Tom Baker video and that really um, gained some traction. And uh, then when I realized that people were 
appreciating as I slowly started adding a bit more detail, certainly to the pre-production part of it. Uh, I thought that it would be a ch too challenging for me perhaps to get to spend too much time on like the casting and the the producers and the development of things. Uh, so you'll see in those in those early ones, I very much skip straight to like the casting of the Doctor and that's it. And then I go on and start talking about the stories. I do hope at some point to return to those earlier ones and just sort of update them. Uh, I've got better equipment now as well. So I, you know, they could be in HD and I could do some more um, interesting things about some of the minutiae because I, I felt I gave a bit short shrift to some of the key people who inputted certainly in that Hartnell episode, you know, people like Delia Derbyshire and and the music and those kinds of things yeah. that I kind of glossed over a little bit. I'd like to go in a bit more detail, but um sorry, it's a bit of an elaborate way of answering <laughs> no, they, your tell question. What, that can be for the, I suppose um, the thing is is that it's set they'll do in a few years. You know, they'll um they'll re-release it. There'll be a nice HD cover yeah, by yeah. Lee Binding or someone, and you can go like <laughs> full five hours on the Hartnell area. It's gonna be it's gonna be class. Yeah, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> but I think like you say though, I, I've always been quite conscious of keeping it um although I know the vast majority of people watching are going to be fans of Doctor Who or at least enthusiastic about Doctor Who. Mm. Some of the nicest comments that I've received have actually been from people bizarrely who say, I don't really like Doctor Who, but I love watching your videos. Mm. Um, and I find that, you know, the height of flattery really, because it shows that aside from the subject matter, um, people are enjoying, like you say, the structure and the, the pacing of it. Um, so I've always been sort of conscious of, of how to, to sort of make it flow in, in that way. Um, and so now when I when I now add in more detail, I, I would say I agonize far more now about the writing side of it. Mm. So the first thing that I do, I ha I have a kind of a I have a the the word document that has the whole script on has uh, for each section for each doctor's era and companion, it has like bullet points that I've slowly added to randomly about talking points. So I say I must remember to talk about that. And then that kind of evolves further when I then I then look back at um, a variety of different materials. So I'll look at Doctor Who magazines, if it's from the time period itself, um, which obviously with New Who, I, I can do that more easily now. I can look at that. But I also look at like the the um, the series companions and I look at, um, uh, there's a great series of books called About Time, which is by Tatwood, um, which is kind of chronicling far more comprehensively even than than me although i do find them a bit overly cynical at times but they they look at uh they break down every story every year of what was going on behind the scenes and one of the things that has really influenced my approach is the the fact that they look at the social historical context of what was mm. going on in the world at the time what informed the stories in that way um and yeah and so then i just sit down it does it's probably the longest period of time I spend is the writing of it and then once I've finally got that done it feels like I've climbed a mountain but I finally get it and I think yes <laughs> I finally finished this now uh, and it just kind of grows and grows and grows I have a rough idea of you know what the length's probably going to be just because of the topics I'm talking about like when I was doing the recent Brigadier video I thought you know this is going to be a big one yeah um, and then about halfway through uh, I'd got up writing to about the John Pertwee era, so the main Brigadier, and I thought, right, I'm now going to bullet point every single thing I need to talk about just so I know how long this is going to take. And it, it, the bullet points lasted like another page of A4, so I thought, <laughs> yeah, there's a quite a lot here. So, um, uh, and and I do find with the with the newer stuff as well, I do have to go away and do a little bit of research. Uh, like buying DVDs and watching like Sarah Jane Adventures, which I hadn't really watched properly when it was on TV oh, originally. Shame. I know. Well, <laughs> you, you do have to bear in mind that um, I think I was at university at the time that Sarah Jane Adventures That's was fair. on. There is a, a um, smidge of an age. So... <laughs> Yeah, so in fact, I do remember I worked in, I was working in Waterstones and this gentleman came in and bought like the, the first novelizations of Sarah Jane Adventures. And I remember thinking to myself, I, I've, this has completely sort of passed me by. I need to <laughs> tune in and watch this. And I don't think there was iPlayer in those days either. So um, it was harder right. to, I, I have since, uh, I have since gone back. I don't need to. 
anywhere. I have got the complete Sarah Jane Adventures here, which was purchased specifically <laughs> to, uh, yeah, back into the TARDIS behind me. Um, <laughs> That was purchased specifically for uh, my video on the Brigadier, and of course will come in handy when I eventually do one on Sarah Jane. So uh, oh, sometimes it. it takes a little bit of time because I have to go and invest a bit of time in in looking at that, you know. Um, yeah, but yeah, it just sort of grows out of that, really. So where it all begins is just the the, the kind of the, the the weird combination of my what's in my brain and what I read and uh, sort of write and then go away and do something else and and watch something and then come back and finish it off and um yeah i'm not i'm not perhaps as disciplined as people would like me to be with it um but no i'm, uh, I'm getting quite the opposite vibe to be fair i mean there's clearly really? a lot yeah. of thought that goes into each of these videos and it's impressive how much does indeed go into it oh well thank you yeah i think yeah i i I, I, I'm certainly not a perfectionist, and certainly what I produce is not perfection. Of course, a perfectionist would say that, but um, mm. <laughs> I think the thing about a perfectionist is they never get anything done, and I do get things done, but I am someone who I try and set high standards for myself um, because it, it each time I, I do things, I like to kind of push myself a little bit as to what I can achieve or get away with, you know. Um, whether that be something to do with the editing or some special effect or some sound aspect, um, I keep sort of moving it on kind of thing. So I do, and I do, I'm conscious of the fact that, um, you know, people enjoy the standard of stuff that I've produced. And I'm, I'm, I think it's fair to say I'm quite proud of, of the videos that I've done so far. And I look back at that, and I sometimes I'm a little bit surprised. At, I think oh, that's that's not too bad actually. That that part <laughs> there, and I think right. Well, next time I've got to make sure that I do at least as good as that. So um, I don't I don't really. It doesn't stop me from doing things. The probably the thing that stops me from doing things is my job. Um, <laughs> but seeing as that's teaching young children, that's uh, sometimes going to always be a, a higher priority. But um, yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, one of the benefits of my job is that I do have periods of time where I can dedicate myself wholly to to doing a video or something. So, uh, you know, it's just finding that balance, you know. No, absolutely. I mean, I work in a nursery, so uh, much mm. like yourself, you know, when you're looking after children, it, that does obviously take priority. So I, yeah. I, I see you there, although but are teaching older <laughs> children. What, what age group do you teach out of curiosity? Uh, well, I, uh, high school, so 11 oh, to one. 16. Oh, so it can be tricky, age. yeah. <laughs> but very rewarding as well. Oh, I'm sure, um, yeah. I, I'm lucky enough to be in a kind of a unique position now. I used to be a, a you know full-time English teacher, traditional English teacher in a classroom with 30 students. The role that I have now means that I work with smaller groups and I have a room in the main corridor which is kind of open to help with literacy and English is my main focus. So I, I support literacy and I'm the librarian as well. Um, so, uh, you know, I have a kind of open door policy. So I've had quite a few students over the years who've come in and perhaps have been a little bit like I was at school, kind of not really fitting in, not really having a place. Although I was quite fortunate, I had a kind of very small but dedicated sort of friendship group and we were all equally kind of nerdy, especially about yeah. Doctor Who. Um, but there's been students through our doors from time to time, of course, don't have that support group. So I've been quite fortunate to be able to... Um, be that person who can talk to them about Doctor Who or Star Wars or Marvel or something like that, you know. <laughs> no, that's terrific. I'm sure. Like, I, I'm, I know if I was at school, I'd get a right kick out of that. Um, <laughs> going back, would you? Um, I'm curious because there's obviously when you delve into the sort of nitty gritty of of the show and the might, like you say, the minutiae of it. Uh, you'll learn a lot of sort of fun little tidbits that you might not have known otherwise. Would you say there's some favourites that you've picked up over the past, whether it be about a specific actor or just uh, the show being made? Um, I think some of the some of the most interesting things that I've learned uh, doing these videos is going back and looking at the kind of the biographies of the lead actors mm. and learning about their their past. And what brought them to the place that they were? Um, obviously, Christopher Eccleston's bio, uh, autobiography that came out 
coincided with me doing my video or writing my video on Christopher yeah. Eccleston. So that was quite a fortunate thing where research was very pleasurable in that sense. I did the same with Peter Davison, read his autobiography. Um, I, I want to get a hold of the biography that William Hartnell's actual granddaughter, Jessica Carney, wrote, but I don't have a copy of it at the minute because I'd like to do a bit more on uh, on his background because I find that quite fascinating, the idea that he was, he was kind of ashamed um, of his past and the fact that his father, he never met his father, he never knew his father, and he kind of constructed a bit of a false history for himself that he would tell to people so that people wouldn't learn. Obviously, when he grew up, it would have been perhaps a far more judgmental time. Um, and I do know that he was fired, I think, by Noel Coward. He was in a play and he showed up one day to a, to a performance late for the rehearsal. Sorry, it wasn't the performance, the rehearsal period. Right. And Noel Coward just tore a strip of him in front of the whole cast and fired him on the spot. Oh, and blimey. I could just think of William Hartnell, who we think of as this very cantankerous lead yeah. being kind of torn a strip off by um it, i think it was noel coward it might have been someone someone like Lawrence olivier it was someone big like that you know um so yeah and, and again see this is why i'd like to go back to the videos and just put in a, a little snippet of, of how they got there a little bit more um one of the most interesting stories is one that i haven't actually um done as part of a video yet but i do and i eventually i do intend to perhaps when i eventually talk about the TARDIS because I do have a sort of TARDIS appendix video planned and that was about uh, uh, Peter Brahatsky which a lot of people don't really know anything about him you know he was the designer of the original TARDIS console okay. uh, room and uh, and the tar the exterior the interior of the TARDIS um, on an earthly child and uh, people don't really know about him because uh, he died um, before fandom really started going he sort of died in 1980 so Doctor Who magazine had just sort of started and people had just started kind of you know the Doctor Who Appreciation Society had kind of been founded but there wasn't lots and um the only kind of anecdote for a long time that anyone knew about him is that he was quite grumpy uh and so because Verity Lambert and Morris Hussein said you know he he just didn't really seem to care and that's how he ends up in an adventure in space and time yeah, I was gonna just say this, I was wondering if his character yeah, if didn't him. seem to care um but there, there, there's quite a more to it than that because a few a few years back uh, in Dot Who magazine, um, Graham Kibble White did a, a kind of a a little bit of investigative journalism uh, uh, to sort of get in touch with his family and find out who he was, um, and uh, he was quite ill at the time, which was one of the reasons probably why he was a bit cantankerous. Um, but uh, he he had come from Poland um, and had been a, a young man during the the second world war so he'd experienced the occupation of poland by the nazis he had been in the polish resistance um he ended up at one point randomly in in germany uh from where he sent a, a postcard um to someone in his family and he'd se he'd sent it from berchtesgaden which was the kind of the, the the heart of Nazism, really. That was where Hitler had his eagle's nest and Goering had a house and all this kind of thing. And you think, why is this Polish resistance member in the heart of Nazism? And uh, coincidentally, about the same time, there was a, a planned um, special operation uh, by the sort of forerunner of MI6 to parachute two SAS members into Berchtesgaden to assassinate Hitler. And they were supposed to make contact with two resistance uh, members who were going to guide them and, and, and help them, um, which in the end it was called off. But Brahatsky was there at that time and then oh. he he fled from there and then the Nazis were after him specifically uh, and they caught him in Liechtenstein and sent him to Dachau concentration camp where he was for about four months before the war ended essentially. So, you Blimey. know, all this fascinating... I think that's the thing that I find really interesting is that Doctor Who is always like a springboard for me to find out other things. I was saying the other day about how it's been, sounds slightly pretentious, but it's almost like a, a, a foundation for me, but also like a prism through which I've seen the world. Um, I've learned so much about and been inspired to go and learn about other historical periods and other programs and the yeah. nature of television making and all those kinds of things just through my interest in this silly science fiction show you know <laughs> i suppose because of the show being so big you're always gonna fight i mean it's been going on for so long that even world mm. war ii and hitler 
can be uh, just <laughs> brought up in the tidbits. About well, absolutely. The guy who made it. That's that's fascinating. Absolutely. Though. Yeah, um, yeah. I await the TARDIS video whenever that would. Um, I guess <laughs> yeah, I'm not quite sure I'm going to get that story in. I guess. Well, uh, unless that's a separate I, thing where you do like the Sonic. I, I don't know. I thought. Yeah, I thought. Well, it, at, currently I have a plan for um, because eagle-eyed viewers of my channel may have noticed if you look at the playlists that the companion series is appendix c um don't ask me why i made it appendix c and not appendix a but i did appendix a is the tardis and i'm not quite oh. sure how i'm going to do it yet whether i'm going to do each iteration of the tardis or whether i'm going to do one big video i suppose I it depends on how much you can find on, on each yeah TARDIS. well that's true like, yeah you know, i imagine like one tardis appears in one story and you're like Okay, I've got to do this one then. Uh. <laughs> well, as I say, I mean, I've been trying to... It's, I want it to be kind of like a blend between the kind of the factual real-world things and the fictional universe. Um, so I want to have a like a, a tour that I create, um, a CGI reconstruction of the TARDIS console room, and then you can go around and see it. So oh, I've been studying for several years now. The the we talk about the minutiae. I I yes. um the, the other night I was finding the exact depth of the screwdriver. Um, I don't know what you call it, but <laughs> you know, in a screw, when you when you put the screwdriver into the screw, there's like a notch. I was trying to find what the depth was to make sure that the screw on one of the controls on my TARDIS console that I'm building is the correct depth. So. Well, that's, um, yeah, minutia, <laughs> I'd say, is the word there. <laughs> Insane, <laughs> probably. Well, it's a testament to how much work goes in, I suppose. It's not something I would personally think of, but there we go. That's why I'm not making the reviews. <laughs> well, I thought, you know, I've got to make this screw. And I thought, well, I've got to make the, the notch in it. So how deep should it be? So I looked up what the screw was. Um, fortunately, there's been so, I mean, like you're saying about the work that I've done, but truly I, I the, all the stuff that I've created has all been standing on the shoulders of, of giants, really, of things like Doctor Who magazine and Andrew Pixley and all these, Richard Bignall, you know, all these people that have done all this research and really like created a, a, a kind of a scholarly history of Doctor Who in so many ways and that's something that's inspired me. I mean when I grew up Doctor Who wasn't on the television so my my uh continued kind of exposure of Doctor Who was through that that kind of almost academic study of of television. I mean Doctor Who magazine has always been um now of course it it has to be promotional as well because the show's on on the air and all that but it it's always been a kind of a a separate work from any other kind of tv tie-in magazine it, it's a it's a fantastic uh, uh you know resource oh, absolutely. and i very much kind of built on on their their work really or stole it uh, if you want to put it that way <laughs> <laughs> as long as it's not word for word again like you being a teacher no. <laughs> you should know you just gotta change a little bit just change a smidge just change the odd word yeah yeah there we go no, no, no one will be the wiser <laughs> So, um, well, I suppose building off the, the TARDIS uh, video concept, how much of the future is planned? Because obviously you're doing every Doctor, but you're mm. also doing what seems to be a, a companion from each era at the moment. Well, how that's kind of coincidental, being, uh, planned? really. So, yeah, a lot of people think that I, I'm choosing the companions and I'm doing it in some sort of pattern. But actually, the, the companion videos were something that kind of... Um, came out of the fact that I wanted to do some shorter videos. <laughs> Ironically, <laughs> the, the pre video one was very long. But uh, I wanted to do something that would I would be able to get out a bit quicker. Mm. Uh, I'd created um, a Patreon page uh, because a lot of people had said, you know, you should do that. Because um, I can't, I don't, I can't monetize my videos and I wouldn't anyway because I don't really like adverts interrupting things on YouTube. Yeah. Um, so people said, you know, we'd like to give you some money. And I, I thought, well, I can't really say no if lots of people are saying they should do that. Why not? Um, so I thought, uh, you know, I'd create that and I, I didn't make tears and things like that partly because i i didn't know what i could offer as value for money other than what i was already doing but uh 
Um, I always said that, you know, if people wanted to give me some money, it should be something that they wouldn't miss if it fell out of their wallet or something like that kind of thing. Yeah. But I thought I need to give them a little bit more input into things uh, because to, to recognize. So I, I do a from time to time, I do a, a poll on um, which companion I should look at. And then the one that wins the poll is the one that I eventually do as a video. Um, okay. So the Brigadier won, won last time. Uh, in fact, the first poll I did didn't include the Brigadier. Uh, and as soon as I popped him in in the second one, he ran away with it. Before that was was Ace was the forerunner. And I know oh. there were a few people that were disappointed that it wasn't Ace. Yeah. So now the idea the was name. rather... <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see next time. I'll put a new poll on soon so uh, people can, can vote I'm for that. Um, but uh, it was... It was it, the idea behind that was that uh, I wanted to uh, do thing. I didn't necessarily want to do from the very beginning uh, in order. Uh, I wanted people to say, well, if I, you know, wanted to learn about uh, Ace, for example, uh, they wouldn't have to wait years before I necessarily got there. You know, they could right. they could choose and they could vote for it. It's just coincidental. Maybe this is just the the kind of neat, tidy, ordered fans. <laughs> That, that that are my patrons that they voted first of well i i did susan i did choose susan to do first because i thought well that's a nice one to start with mm. and then they voted for jamie which of course is the second and then they vote for brigadier who's mainly associated with the third so it's funny uh, to see next that it's time, kind of accidental I, don't know. I didn't know that's brilliant. yeah 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 and i have to keep reminding people like they're saying like who are you going to do next i say i don't know it depends on what people vote for because they assume i'm going to do sarah jane or someone you know but it could be it could be martha it could be it could be it would vicky confuse everyone. you know it could be any of them but like anyone who you know, doesn't know yeah, that and yeah. just sort of jumps to like i don't know yaz it's just like what the <laughs> <Yeah>. hold on <laughs> well saying that i did i did when i started it i did leave any new who companions off the list right. only because at that point i hadn't done the christopher eccleston or no i hadn't done the david tennant video and so i didn't want to do anyone that i hadn't already covered yeah, in the main series sense. Um, I, I think for the next one, only just to make it kind of fair for people who perhaps wanted someone from the classic era, I might still leave off the New Who companions and just do that and then add them all after I do the Matt Smith video. Um, oh, yes. Uh, that's for the New Who I'm ones. Pa just very patiently kind of awaiting so that. That's Matt the Smith next one. one. <laughs> that's, see, that's, yes. that, the Matt Smith um, era hit that sweet spot for my age where. I was just sort of getting into understanding the show because I liked David Tennant's era, yeah. but I was still young. So I was just kind of watching it and not fully taking it in. Mm. It's so the Smith era will be a fun one to watch. How, how goes that one? <laughs> well, it's one I of ask? my favorite eras as well. Mm. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's going well. I, I do it. I mean, one of the things about the new series is that I've kind of lived and breathed Doctor Who for so many years, but the newer stuff um from a production point of view and the kind of not the gossip but the kind of nitty gritty behind the scenes you you, you kind of have to delve in a little bit more and, and cut through some of the rumor online there's less you know doctor who magazine and stuff have done lots of interviews with classic production staff where you can kind of get to the bottom of things you know and obviously mm -hmm. even with the even with the um with the first few years of of um the new era you've got bit of more of an insight perhaps from what Russell T Davis has written in the writer's tale and things like that um but I do find I have to I have to do a lot more it's less in here I have to do a lot more actual research to really find out because I I would say that I have um the way I've enjoyed New Who is much more just as a viewer rather than as an active kind of um other than what I've read in Doctor Who magazine, which is usually, as I say, promotional. So it's kind of, I'm trying to think away, not saying it harshly, but it's kind of, there's a lot of PR there. There's not, there's a lot of hype, but it doesn't always say very much, if you know yeah. what I mean. Like people say, like, I really love working on this. I love working on this pe person, but you don't always get the nitty gritty, like behind the scenes. I get you. And of course, with, with the classic era, you've got so many people reflecting on it. You've got so many fantastic documentaries that are really detailed that you can you can get down and really drill down to some of the fine details where the new era takes a little bit more work to to yeah. access that information so when you get to the Whitaker um, era you're going to be in trouble then because it's been defined <laughs> well, the, talk by about spoilers. and down the hatches yeah <laughs> yeah 
yeah i don't know about that yeah we'll see um but yeah it's it, it I mean, it's there again, as always, I feel that sense of, you know, how am I going to, I always kind of worry a little bit. I think, you know, how am I going to do this? How, how am I going to maintain that, that standard? But I somehow kind of pull it off um, with, with the Matt Smith era, of course, is you've got so much to cover um, arguably perhaps more so than the David Tennant era in that, you know, I've got, I've got the new, the new uh, production team coming in. Um, I want to focus a little bit more on the music, which I haven't looked at so much so far in the in the new era. Because for me, uh, Murray Gold's music I felt really developed uh, in a way that I enjoyed in the Matt Smith era. Mm. Um, I got to talk about the the emergent popularity of it in America again, because um, in that second Matt Smith season, that was where they really kind of launched it in America again, didn't they? And they oh, filmed yeah, especially with like series six. in America and all that. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and then of course I got the fiftieth anniversary. Oh God, um, yeah. <laughs> For some reason, that didn't even clock. I was like, oh yeah, just <laughs> yeah. So oh yeah. <laughs> so it, it's kind of trying to think how am I going to weave all these things kind of together? Because I don't want it to be like little snippets of information and zooming on you kind of got to find a bit of a a, a through line for it i mean uh the foot you asked me earlier about you know where does it start and i'll uh, it's just occurred to me actually is the first thing i usually come up with funnily enough is how am i going to start this video because mm. i quite like doing my little cold opens on things um, yeah, my favourite one of those is probably in the tenant video where you have little yeah, David yeah. McDonald watching his telly, and I'm like, oh, it's wholesome. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> well, I'm glad you like that because that was what. Yeah, I, that that came out pretty much how I hoped it would. Um, I was a bit worried because the only photograph of David McDonald at that age is uh, is not the highest quality, mm. uh, but I think I kind of pulled it off and had him watching, you know, City of Death on the television, and I, that was, that was based on an anecdote that that he told um, about it. Uh, originally, I, I'd hoped to have like somehow have children running around in the back garden with a Tom Baker scarf, but because I only had that one photo of him looking very kind of amazed uh because yeah. actually he he'd, i think it was because he'd received some fantastic present for christmas um but i thought that that works watching the telly in his pajamas um but yeah i thought well that's the through line into it isn't it because it's the dream of of tenant and becoming the doctor and then having to relinquish the role of the doctor you know his i don't want to go is pure David Tennant saying that line, you know, I don't yeah. think of the doctor saying that line. It, it, that's a bit of a fourth wall breaking. Well, it's, it's Tennant and Davis saying, I don't want to go. Um, and they haven't, have they? So, no, really. well, yeah, um, but Tennant already came back and it's still in that new game and Davis will be, yeah, that didn't work in hindsight. <laughs> yeah, you can't escape. Again, that'd you be can't a funny escape. one to come back to, though. So he says, oh, I don't want to go. And so he didn't. And here he is again. <laughs> here he is again. Yeah. Yeah. So I had that through line. I, and uh, with the, with the, um, Sylvester McCoy video, I felt very much this is about, I, instead of rounding off in a way the Colin Baker era when it did, I thought it would be more appropriate to say how it was cut off in a way. So that was why I had that opening with the phone call uh, where I kind of reimagined how it would be, um, yeah. how it would have gone. Um, that's actually the, 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 the actual dialogue from that phone call is from an interview with Colin Baker. So I didn't just make it up. Yeah, um, wonder, so it might actually, not be a hundred percent true, but um no, it still did very well. No, that was, a um, that was another terrific cold on <laughs> Uh And uh, yeah, and then with the, you know, I just think about how am I going to draw draw the the viewer in, kind of thing. That's how I kind of begin. Um, I must admit the one the one thing that I that I, I mean, it, it's different from the kind of videos that I make. But the one thing I, that kind of I find a bit obnoxious on YouTube is a. A YouTuber popping up and going, "What's up, guys? How's you going?" Kind of <laughs> Smash thing. Smash that like I, button. <laughs> yeah, that all that was. <laughs> that was the thing. That was the the thing that I leave the you know like and subscribe if you want more videos right until the end. Yeah, uh, and maybe that's just me being too. Uh, I don't know. Uh, not not enthusiastic enough about getting people, but I always felt that if it was good, people got to the end, they're, they're going to like and subscribe. 
as a result of it. So I've never yeah. thought about how to make my videos to appeal to a particular algorithm. I do have an audience in mind. I have myself in mind. If I was watching this, would I? What would I like? Kind of thing. Mm. Um, I'd say the only the only kind of concession I do make in my videos to kind of the YouTube format is that sometimes they go a little bit faster than I would want to make if I was making, say, a proper proper documentary. <laughs> Um, I was going to start again. That because, comes back to the pacing thing. It's such yeah. so different because I I personally cut quite quickly. I'm, I'm mm. sort of known for the the fast pace, and maybe that's just because I don't like the sound of my own voice as much as uh, <laughs> <laughs> I kid. I kid. Well, also but, you're doing you're doing it far more naturally than me as well, aren't you? So you know, mine are still very con mine are very contrived. You know, I write it down and then I you know I stand oh, yeah, here I and do my do my voice over <laughs> voice. Uh, and then I, I listen through the whole thing. I, I make so many mistakes when I record and I listen through the whole thing and I cut out every single breath in the latest ones because it annoys me to hear me going, <gasps> especially oh, with my God. sentences yeah, as well, because I've been, I've been so criticized for how long. It's yeah, yeah. It's, and you know you kind of do that. Sentence as well, I can't help it. I just breathe out whenever I say a joke. I'm like, and and I'm like, oh great, and that's weird. <laughs> I have to find where I can cut that off. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. They, you notice all these little foibles that you do that mm. you're not aware of. Um, so yeah, so I do all, do all that, but it's much more contrived, as I say, than than it seems. But yeah, I, I I've tried to slow down a little bit more. I think it's a little bit like feeling like on the radio. Apparently, there's a I don't know if this is a bit of an urban myth, but on on like BBC Radio, apparently there's some. Uh, system which kicks in that if no one speaks like a DJ speaks for like 10 seconds or five seconds if yeah. it's like dead air it automatically starts playing something really? um, and I don't know That'd if that's a fun. bit of an urban myth but it is it is like you hear where you know everyone's trained all the DJs they're trained to just never stop speaking never take a breath kind of between the thing and then move straight onto the song and there's no silence because it gives people an opportunity to switch over yeah um, and I think I don't know if it's it's certainly not necessarily a conscious thing, but in my videos on YouTube, I think I've been aware of not leaving similar dead spaces within, um, whether that be with the visuals or with the with the audio in some way. Um, I've tried to kind of slow down a little bit, leave a little bit more breaks, and bring the music in, but then have I think if I was doing it professionally, I'd, I'd probably slow it down a bit more then the video would probably be like two hours long <laughs> so. well the, i mean to be fair like i found oddly some of the longer episodes to be some of my favorites because they go so in depth i mean again like the tom baker mm. one for example and i think that is one of the longest ones and that is still the mm. highest viewed one now granted that's probably yeah. because it's Tom Baker. That helps. Yeah, as Tom as Baker. I think yeah. Said. yeah, definitely. But no, I just, I don't know. There's more to talk about. And I find it very, I don't yeah. know. I'll be honest. Now I'm just trying to think of how you're going to start the Smith one. Like, because you said about the cold open. So I now I'm trying to just guess in my own head. Gonna like, is it going to be making fun mm. of the adventure games? <laughs> is it going to be a phone call with Stephen Moffat? <laughs> no, no. Is, oh, I'm it, not what's sure what's how I'm head? going to present it. But I, but I think, to give you a bit of a, I think how it's going to go. Um, because all these things are up in the air until I do the final draft. You know, I have things written down, but how it's going to go, I mean, it's not set in stone yet. But I, I think the in for this will be about Stephen Moffat's entrance as a way as becoming the showrunner. Right. Whereas the last episode was very much about Tennant because I'd looked at Russell T. Davis more in the Chris Elkiston episode. I think this one will be more about how Moffat becomes the, the 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 writer, you know, the head writer. Yeah, so I think it, I need to do that does make a, a little bit sense, more about him because in with with Tennant, obviously his story was so ingrained with Doctor Who even as a child. But like with Matt Smith, for mm. example, it's more of just another job. At least that's how it looks from the outside yeah. looking in. So focusing in on Moffat. Well, yeah, I mean, he wasn't a fan necessarily, was he? Yeah, no. I uh, think certainly yeah. embraced well, it wholeheartedly. If you need a Moffat, I. I, you know, I'm available. <laughs> I'll, I'll do. I'll, do I'll bear that in mind. I'll hop in. I think I'll bear be that great. in mind because I'm terrible at the voices. Like I, when I did, 
I think when I did the very first, the very first, I did the William Hartnell video, and I had Sidney Newman quoted talking about how Verity oh, Lambert yeah, was from accent. piss and vinegar. <laughs> uh, well, no, with that time I just did it in, in my my voice, and then when I did the Patrick Troughton one, and uh, I started to feel a little bit more. I thought oh, I've got to do the got to do the voice where he's like. Um, what you guys doing, you know? And I made him sound like some sort of New Yorker. It's probably <laughs> nothing like how he sounded at all, you know, but I felt there needs to be a little bit. I've got a little bit more confident with doing some of the different voices, um, but, yeah, I'm not an impressionist. So. <laughs> well, I'm pretty much all voices. I can't, I slip in, <laughs> yes, in and out I've seen. all the time. So <laughs> if you want a voice, if you do, if you need a little Smith, I, I'll hop in and do a little Smith. If you want a Moffat, oh, I'll do a Moffat. <laughs> if you need an Amy Pond, get someone else. <laughs> <laughs> well i say the scottish accent is one that i i cannot i cannot manage somehow <laughs> is, is i can do the done? odd i can do the odd one i've done like 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 as a, a teacher like with lockdown and stuff we we did um uh i i tend to teach groups of students who struggle a little bit with reading independently so during lockdown as part of their they, they were going to have to read novels and i thought this is going to be quite a challenge for them so i said to my head of department i said well look do you want me to record can i just record it and she said oh. yeah that would be really good in fact record all the books <laughs> and we'll just do it for the all year group so um yeah it was well, you dropped was, yourself was in that one didn't you? <laughs> during lockdown yeah i did but i kind of enjoyed it i did like the woman in black i did sherlock holmes and i had to do all cockney accent i, I thought well i've got to do oh, the, I'd the pay accent good money you know, for that. And, uh... where's the order <laughs> for that well you can actually get the sign of four on my Patreon, I, I gave it away. And this year for Christmas, I'm thinking about maybe the woman in black I might upload onto there, which I did a few sound spooky sound effects as well to make them a bit more immersive. So, oh, totally, uh, <laughs> yeah. I'd, I'd listen to it's, that. It's a terrible northern accent that I used in the woman in black because it's not specific about exactly where they go uh, mm. in that story, um, but it, it's somewhere up north. So oh, well, where was that in the Eccleston episode? That, you know. I would have loved that. Like, oh, <laughs> oh, that would have been, that would have been proper uh, tickle me. Well, um, <laughs> thank you very much for coming on, Miss Mister Dick Films, if that is your real name, uh, <laughs> or should I call you Rick? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. I'd rather be called Dick. Yeah, thank you so much for coming on, uh, and uh, oh, thank you for time having me. Show. Oh, it's an honour. Thank you very much. I was very, very, very gratified when you when you said, "Can I?" Uh, promote your sort of brigadier video and then seeing it in your in the roundup of your different <laughs> things last week was was incredibly gratifying so thank you for that so yeah and when you oh, said well i must have him on the show at some point i thought well yeah absolutely <laughs> well, i'm more than yeah, happy to should. be <laughs> <laughs> no so, and then no i then you know no yeah absolutely i mean um you know i've been i've been on a, a, a few things these last few months um yeah i you know, listened and, to your um, it's really uh, appearance yeah Oh, well, that was that that was interesting because it turns out that Josh lives just down the road from he me. He told me about that because he yeah. we were planning a in person interview anyway. Oh, like yeah. I was going to come down to him, but then whilst uh -huh. we were doing it, he said, "Oh, by the way, if you ever needed Clever Dick Films as well," and I'm like, "I'm already interviewing it. God damn it, I could have gone both of you." <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe for maybe for the future at some point for, for series two of the community show. Yes, I'm coming and uh, uh, to coming down there. I was about to say. Well, I was, I was, I was it. rather disappointed actually because, as I was saying, is being on these different. It's really made me feel a sense of, I mean, like the name of your show, the community, which. Um, well, it sounds a little bit pathetic, but I've never really been a part of a community before. My my fandom when I was growing up was very much uh, it wasn't quite solitary. I you know I had good a good friend Simon who we both enjoyed Doctor Who, but I didn't really go to conventions. I didn't really I wasn't really part of these aspects and stuff. So one of one of the great um, uh, benefits of doing my channel has has been you know meeting fantastic people like yourself who are really I've been really amazed at, at all the kinds of things that you're doing and Josh is doing Adam Martin all these people making these podcasts and videos and you know it's uh it's really inspiring and I I wish in a way I'm kind of envious because I'm a little bit older than you guys I think um, and uh, I kind maybe, of maybe a little we bit. didn't have yeah a little bit I we didn't really have those same opportunities when i when i was younger so it's great to see and i don't mean that in a kind of i mean in the sense of it's great to see that you you know you're 
people are using these things to do a lot of good and spread a lot of positivity, you know? So, so thank you for that. Because even when I started doing my channel, there wasn't as much around. So it's lovely no, to see. And thank you for letting me be a part of it, even if only in a small way. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure. And I'll be, I'll be adding you <laughs> to my little piece of art. I've got of uh, all my guests. Oh, wonderful! I'm, I, I'm still <laughs> needing to figure out where I'm going to plonk you. Cause it, it's surprisingly already quite busy. But I'll, it's a bit crowded, I'll, I'll, I'm sure yeah, I'll, I'll show that. you that when I've figured it out. <laughs> yes, thank you for Excuse coming me a little on. Bit. <laughs> yeah, I think this might be one of the longer interviews, so you might hold a record there. I do that. I do that. Sorry, I, no, I have a tendency it's, to waffle. I always say my it's wife better to have a long, a long drawn-out <laughs> answer than just a, yeah, and that be it. So I'll, I'll yeah, take I don't think it. I've given a yeah answer for a few years now. <laughs> <laughs> Right, I will click the little robot lady.